Hey boy, what's going on? Hope you guys are doing good. I am doing just great. So I'm here with the Mitchell MS450, which is a Guitar Center special. These were made for or by Guitar Center. And uh, for them to sell, put on your shelves and stuff, kind of their house brand. It's not a bad Les Paul. It's actually... You know, it's actually pretty nice. I'm really kind of surprised when I got this that uh, the shape of this one was in needs a little TLC, and I ended up doing a little bit of work on it a while back, but it needs a little bit more work. I kind of hung on, hung it up, and forgotten about it because I got busy doing other stuff and projects for other people. I received a package yesterday, and it is the body for my next project. Um, I've got a couple of templates that are supposed to be coming. I've got a couple of necks that are coming and a few other bits and pieces for that build. And uh, just waiting to gather everything I need. Might as well work on something in the meantime. I've got the Jackson done, Kramer done. And pretty much everything that I needed to get done is done and out of here. Uh, I do have the green Les Paul uh, Epiphone 100 that I need to still complete. I haven't done anything with that yet. I am waiting for another neck to come in from my buddy and um, I got to respray it. I didn't feel like stripping it down. So it's like, yeah, had some problems because of the mahogany. I didn't use any grain filler on it. I figured, well, it's not going to be too bad, but the finish started to bubble, air started to come out of the wood and cause some issues with the finish. So not a big deal. I can refinish that, no problems. I just have to do it a different way in order to keep the finish from bubbling on that. So I'm going to work on this thing. The frets on this are pretty good, exception of down here, they get a little bit sharp, which on a lot of Les Paul guitars, even bigger brand name models have the same issue, where, you know, closer to the body, they start getting a little bit sharp. It's like they're afraid to work in this area to fix the problem. Well, they'll protect the body a little bit and fix it. But all the rest of the frets feel pretty good. They're a little bit dirty. I do need to do a little polishing on them and get them cleaned up. They're not damaged in any way. Uh, although this guitar has some bruises on it, it doesn't seem like it is in like really, really bad shape as far as the guitar goes. I take the back cover or plate off. I do have the pickups loose right now because I'm going to end up sanding down this finish and re polishing it you know doing another buff job on it so as you can see here they ended up shielding with the shielding paint the inside of the cavities for the humbuckers and the pickups aren't really marked it one just says neck and the other one just says bridge on it and some type of a decal sticker now this is a veneer there is no doubt about it, it's a veneer. You can tell just by how this edge looks over here. Um, there's not even a cap on top of this. So all of your drilling and stuff, these are all hard drilled inside here. It was probably drilled without the neck before they start going from one chamber to the other chamber. You can tell this is on a little bit of an angle, so you know that this is not a cap on top of this body. It's one piece. and. I don't even think that the binding on this thing is a real wood binding. They've kind of made it look like it's real wood by by giving it a stained look, so to say. So it kind of has like a flame maple look to it. But it really doesn't go into the flame maple top like you would think it would if it was a true flame maple cap. All in all, the price range of these guitars it isn't bad for a, like, from what I've been reading, an entry level or somewhat of an entry level guitar. Price range, you can go for anywhere a little bit over $300 to about $150. Bucks. And that's not what I paid for it, though. I paid much, much a lower price. And I feel kind of bad for the seller because I don't think he was really wanting to sell it at a, a low price low ball price but it's the internet you know people see people want people buy and regardless of what the bid was you gotta take it and gotta sell it unless you put a reserve on it now 
The body of this thing is in really good shape as far as the body goes. The body doesn't have any damage to it or anything else like that. It's more finish damage than anything else that's on here. So I got a few marks inside of here. I got a little bit over here that, that's kind of like not smooth. It's a little bit chewed up over here. So it's not really damaged and it's in the binding. Um, there's some scratches going on in this thing. There's not really dense inside of it, but there are some low spots on it. So as far as quality, as far as being built goes, unless things have happened to this guitar uh, that you know nobody really knows about. It's got a ding here, it's got a ding there. But from what I can see as far as getting in the light and looking at some of the things in the light, they look like finished flaws. Like there's um, there's a little bit of a dimple in the wood or underneath the finish that the finish kind of just flowed with, gone with the flow, basically. So it's not like bad and you really gotta move it around in the light to see it. Now when I do the wet sanding on this top, that is going to hopefully correct some of that problem and make it a nice surface again. Now this is a little bit of a arch top and it's not as much as a Les Paul would be because of the way this comes up and this is not as flat here like a Les Paul would be. Les Paul's got maybe like, I don't know, an inch and a half, maybe two inches going around the edge, maybe two inches, probably more like an inch and a half. This is a little bit less. Actually, it's a lot less. And you got your flat area and then it goes up into the arch. Well, this is not really arch really high at all. The fretwork on this thing seems to be really nice. Um, there doesn't seem to be any wear at all. Just kind of like the frets are just you know, tarnished a little bit from being dirty. Real nice inlays on here. They feel pretty good as far as how smooth they are. I'm not going to do any type of a fret leveling to this or even um, you know, crowning or anything. It, it doesn't need it. It just needs a good cleaning and taking care of a little bit of these fret ends over here. And like I was saying about the headstock, the headstock had a little bit of damage over here and the top cap of the headstock, which this is all a cap over here, it's probably like some type of a plastic, uh, was peeling up, coming up a little bit. So I ended up putting some CA glue underneath it, clamping it down for a bit, just with some uh, masking tape, and then going ahead and filling in what was missing over here as far as the chip goes of the cap with some epoxy resin. And it seemed to have kind of like worked out pretty well, but it just needs a little bit of TLC. You can kind of see the transition from the cap to the epoxy resin pesky finger in the lens of the camera, huh? Yeah. All right, so the tuners don't really have any type of a name on them. They're not branded at all, but they are a locking tuner. And I'm not sure of the ratio of it is. I haven't really looked at the specs on them as being a quality tuner, but they hold without slipping at all pretty nice. And this lock mechanism is just a screw on lock and you can unscrew it all the way. And you got some real nice brass gearing inside there, which look a little bit on the dry side, but sometimes it's not worth putting a little bit of a lube or any type of a grease or oil inside of some of these tuners because that can cause dust and other crap to accumulate inside those gears in time and kind of like make it a little bit difficult to turn. So they kind of match the headstock with the shape of the truss rod cover on this and you could tell that somebody really tightened that truss rod cover down because of the way that the hole is kind of pushed in a little bit. Yeah, it's either a wrong screw or you just tighten it really, really tight. So I'm gonna get into this fretboard and start filing down these fret ends and getting them nice to the touch.
So the frets on this are not in too bad of a shape. There's no wear on them whatsoever. They do need a little bit of a cleaning as far as like polishing goes or whatnot. The fret ends themselves, they're a little bit sharper on this end of the uh, neck than they are on this end of the neck. But I'm gonna go ahead and work all the way down. I'm using the Stumac 1175 and this has got a rounded edge on this side and a flat surface on this side there's no grit on this side and there's no grit on this side but i wouldn't recommend using the flat side to go onto your fretboard because depending if it's a binded neck or not if you go a little bit on an angle with it you're going to end up digging into the fretboard itself but i kind of use it at times because i can get really flat with it and really close to that edge and round that off really nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with this. Beautiful, all the way down. Nothing feels like it's grabbing any skin. It's nice and smooth. So I'm gonna go ahead and flip the guitar around. And start working on the other side. Nice all the way down, no problems. So I'm going to go ahead and use some fret erasers now. Now you have a 1000 grit, you have a let me see if I can feel the difference here. Yes, you have a 400 grit, and then you have a 180 grit. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit this with the 180. Now I'm gonna go with the 400. Now to finish it off with the 1000. Alright, so after putting the tools that I don't need away, I'm going to blow off the neck over here to get rid of any metal shavings. And then go into polishing the fretboard. Now, I don't mind using, uh, or polishing the fronts. I don't mind using the Dremel. It seems to work out pretty good. And I don't have any problems with control as far as uh, staying in one spot or you know heating up the frets and stuff. But I'm just gonna do it manually, kind of do it the hard way. And just get it done. So normally I would mask up the fretboard and do this, but in this case here, the fretboard is not made out of rosewood, it doesn't have any real open pores in it, so the mother's aluminum polish is not really going to get into the fretboard all that much at all. Now if this was a rosewood or something that would have open pores, a lot of open pores, or an older fretboard that uh, you know is just kind of dried out and stuff, I would say yeah, I wouldn't use anything that would uh, get into the cracks of the wood. But in this case, don't have to worry. All about right, that. so for neck conditioning, I am using Feed and Wax by Howard's. Thanks to Detroit Wrecker for sending me a bottle of this stuff. I've been using it ever since I've gotten it, and I stopped using the Dunlop. This stuff just seems to be a little bit better. So I'll just apply a generous amount. And a few frets at a time. Now 
and I'm not using a lot I'm just putting small beads on the rag and a lot of it was soaked into a lot of it was soaked into the rag that I'm using and what I want this to do is I want to coat the fretboard really nice let it sit for a bit and then come back and wipe the excess off so it's been a little bit now and just wiping the excess off the fretboard of the Howard's wax and feed now normally I wash these rags and I reuse them but anytime I do an oil on a fretboard or even the wax and the Howard's wax and feed uh, I do not wash the rag I'll throw the rag away because it's got oil on it and if you wash this with other rags uh, you could chance that oil getting into the water of your washing machine and then getting all the other rags uh, I wouldn't say infected but contaminated with the oil that was on this rag here and that could ruin all of your rags for polishing and doing whatnot because once you get that oil inside these rags it's really hard to get them out so that's why I don't even bother with it anymore. So I'm rubbing the fretboard pretty good and I'm not getting any fuzzies or anything on the edges of the fretboard and the fretboard looks beautiful. So if you're still with me, cool. Right now I'm gonna get into refurbishing this finish, making it nice and shiny again, getting rid of any imperfections and stuff that are possibly in the finish, not necessarily the wood itself, but just level sanding and getting out everything I can get out to make this look like it's flat as a pancake. But when I say pancake, pancakes are kind of arched a little bit and so is this body. So I'm not gonna be able to use a, my sanding block that's a solid block I'm going to have to use a flexible sanding block in order to get the contour and everything else nice and even being careful that I don't fill these craters over here with water so they don't get inside the switches or inside of the pots themselves and all of the holes that I have that are drilled into the body have been filled with a little bit of uh, clear coat and I've got little containers of clear coat that I use for touch-ups. And what that does is that makes a barrier between the finish that's on top of the guitar and the wood that is inside the hole. This way you don't get any wood swelling and causes any problems with the way that you know, the body looks nice and neat. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm starting off with a 1500 grit sandpaper, wet sanding, fresh water, and going to it. All right, so what I'm doing is I'm using the air gun to kind of blow off and dry the finish that is on here to get rid of all the moisture. It just helps with it to evaporate a little bit faster. And I can see like any shiny spots or where there was any low spots. Like over here, I noticed that there was a low spot, so there's a shiny spot right over here. I got a little bit of a shiny spot on this side right over here that I needed to knock down a little bit. But all in all, everything else that I was finding seems to be gone. So this spot here and this spot here will be taken care of with the 2000 grit sandpaper. So I'm not going to have to worry about it. They're not like really, really low spots. So what I'm going to do now is concentrate on this side, moving this pickup over here. All right, so the 1500 grit is pretty much done. Had to fix some damage that was done over here, and I fixed the damage that was done over here. Sanding this out and hitting it with the air. I don't see any deep scratches in this anymore or anything else. And the body seems to be pretty good as far as being straight goes. So the next thing is sanding this down with the 2000 grit sandpaper. 
and again I've already got some sitting in the water soaking. The one thing you have to be careful with when you're using a pad or a flexible sanding block is all of your edges, all of your corners, all of the corners like you would have over here because the pad will end up, if you're putting a little pressure on it while you're sanding, you can wear these corners down and edges down really, really fast if you're not careful. So I don't use a lot of pressure when I'm sanding. I let the sandpaper do the work, not me doing the work. Now this looks kind of nice with a flat finish on it. It has like a, almost like a three-dimensional effect to it, but once I get this thing sanded down and buffed out, it's going to have its own like nice effect to it. Alright, so looking at this, move some of this stuff over over here. Have a look at it in the light a little bit. I don't see any low spots or any shiny spots. And it looks like the 2000 took care of the scratches from the 1500. It's nice and smooth. I mean, this is like, like really, really smooth. And I'm ready to go ahead and start buffing out the top of this to get that shine back on here. Now, I stayed away from the string pharaohs because uh, it's really not bad around those edges and I don't need to pluck those out. I left this guy in there. I'm going to put the other one back in once I buff this side out over here. This had some damage on it. I took the razor blade just to kind of scrape some of the CA glue that I put around the edges over here off of there. And it seems like, you know, I didn't get any water in here. Everything seems to be okay. All right, it's time to buff this thing out. Now I do want to cover up part of the fretboard a little bit because I don't want to sling this uh, rubbing compound all over the place. So I'm going to get a rag and start doing that. And I'll end up moving this rag out of the way when I need to. Again, I'm not sharing the type of rubbing compound that I'm using. Now I do want to knock this neck down a little bit so I don't have a bouncy body trying to do this. All right, so I want to check out the progress that was made with buffing this thing out and all this wet sanding they did and see with the fluorescent light what I got going on as far as divots, dents, or anything else. So looking at the body, I got some rubbing compound over here I got to remove. So looking at the body with the fluorescent lighting and getting it like right in the light and see any type of a flaw that might be in the finish, which I see right here, a little bit of a dent. Otherwise, everything else is looking really good here. So I'm going to do a little bit of wet sanding in this area over here to see if I can get that more even with the clear and buff that again. Yes, the only bad thing about using a flexible sanding block is it contours with everything that is, is going on with the body. So after buffing it out, you can see, especially with fluorescent light and actually almost any type of a light glare, you can see whatever type of an issue that might still be inside your finish. And that's why I say sometimes fluorescent lighting could be your friend or it could be your enemy when it comes to doing any type of a buffing. You can see uh, scratches as far as uh, fine scratches that are still in the finish that are not giving it a mirror-like gloss finish. Uh, 
especially with like the color black and, and darker colors, dark blues and stuff like that, are really, really hard because the light is not forgiving at all. It shows everything. So it may look like it's been polished really, really nice, but when you get it and start moving it around, you'll start to see that there is some areas that you might have missed or didn't work on long enough in order to get those spots nice and shiny again. So I've got this area over here looking good as far as the uh, damage goes. The nice thing about um, CA glue is it buffs out. I mean, you can actually polish CA glue and it buffs to a nice wash finish as well as, you know, using some type of a clear coat. And in some cases, a lot of guitar uh, builders have used CA glue as a clear. I don't know if I would do something like that myself, but yeah, it does have work and it does work pretty good. So what I want to do is I want to sand this area down over here and actually see with the reflection of the light if I could tell if there is some, I'm going to need my air gun. still kind of see it a little bit over here the dent I don't really feel it too much at all but I do see it I'm going to continue to just to sand this area and kind of feather it into the surrounding area a little bit so it doesn't look like there's a crater there even though this is an arch top body and you probably wouldn't even notice it, but yeah. And then I'll go ahead and buff this thing out again and give it its final buffing. So fluorescent lights are not going to lie to you as far as how your finish looks. You can look, if you didn't do a good buff job, and you still have sanding scratches in your finish, it'll look hazy. It'll have like a hazy look. And black, blue, some reds, uh, darker colors will end up showing you that haze, especially if you're on camera or if you're just, you know, under fluorescent lighting. Like I said, the fluorescent lights aren't going to lie to you. They're going to show you everything and anything that is wrong with a finish, including dents, divots, scratches, whatever. So, Right now, I'm going to get this in the fluorescent lighting and kind of look at what's going on with it. And if you look at it, I'll start at the bottom. I mean, it is all... It's all there. It's correct. So I end up knocking out that little dent that was in here. You gotta be careful when you do something like that too because you don't know how much finish is on the body and if you go ahead and keep sanding that area to thinking that you're going to remove that dent um, just by sanding the finish out, you might go through the finish trying to do so. Now luckily this dent that was over here could have been an issue that was caused by the finish itself being a little bit thick in this area and it kind of maybe pu uh, pulled or something. Uh, leaving a little bit of a crater over there so I was lucky to get rid of that and not go through the finish and now I can get basically the pickups back installed after cleaning out the pickup cavities get this post back into place and just clean out a little bit of the uh, rubbing compound that got in some certain areas I wish I could put a regular switch on three-way switch on here but the box switch is what it is now I'm going to take some paint and blacken the insides of these here because um, I think it'll look a lot better. They tried to do so, but it doesn't look very, very good. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then check out the back of this thing to see if there's any type of uh, buffing that needs to be. I'll probably buff it out, but maybe not sand it because the back of this thing doesn't look like it has any scratches or anything on it. The top did, the headstock's got some issues, but I don't think any of it can't be repaired. So a good way to tell to see if the binding is actually wood or not 
is to look at the edge of the nut on the guitar. Do you see some stain on there? The same color as the stain that is on the binding? Well, it's not really wood. So I'm going to work on the headstock on this. This I'm going to be using the flat block and only 2000 grit sandpaper because I don't see any like scratches really in this headstock. So I'm going to start off with just a 2000 flat block and just kind of sand this thing down. So let's take a look at this a little bit and I don't know if you can see this in the camera or not but right over here these would be sanded a little bit more I can still see scratches in it from the 1000 grit sandpaper so I'm going to hit it a little bit more with the 2000 to get that out to nice to get that to smooth out really really nice So the headstock has been polished and what I'm looking for is that deep black shine on there. Now I really can't do too much with that point that's on the headstock right there. I repaired it a while back and it's just going to show that there's a seam there without painting the whole, painting the whole headstock. Yeah, it's just going to have to be there. The back of this body really doesn't have any issues, at least no major ones, and no real scuff mark scratches or anything like that. So I think what I'm going to do is just buff off the back, and I'm going to do a matte finish on the neck, and then buff out the back of the headstock. So that'll be done after I do the buffing on the body. All right, so back turned out pretty nice, even though there wasn't that much of a problem with the back of it. So next I need to get a little bit of the rubbing compound out of some of these cracks, and then start with this neck. Like I said, I want to give the neck a matte finish. All right, so another thing I like to do with guitars is put a generous amount of wax on the body that just protects the finish that much more. So as you can see, I got the post in over here. I got the knobs in over here. I ended up doing the black underneath them, kind of make it look a, just a little bit more better than just having some faded paint underneath them. And you pop these things out and you can kind of see inside there. So same thing with around the three-way switch you know you get that faded paint look underneath there and it just you know just little details like that to just make it a lot better than what it was so if you think that your bridge especially your tunematic bridge can go in in any direction that you feel like putting it or installing it in think again take a look at it and you'll see that some of the saddles the V's that are in the saddles are wider on one side than they are on the other. So that's telling you that, well, the wider string will sit in the wider saddle, right? Right. So next time you end up putting in a tunematic bridge, take a look at that because there are directions as far as which way that bridge should go. So I am ready to wire this thing up, and I mean wire it up by putting its strings on. So I'm going to go with the Dario's. The 
and they're going to be on this thing. I don't like the way they package these because you gotta like be very very careful not to open or unravel them around your guitar because you could scratch the shit out of your guitar. Alright, so the first one I'm going with is the gold. Stay there, don't fall. Yeah, you're gonna fall. Alright, so I'll put you over here for now until I need you. Now the nice thing about this guitar, it has locking nuts, or sorry, locking tuners, which is very nice. Now I always take my index finger, put the string up at the first knuckle, kind of give it a little bit of a tug, loosen up the slack. Now you could do that so you have a little bit more wraps around your tuning peg, but with having locking tuners, it's just a straight shot. Get this thing even up a little bit so it goes into the nut. Yeah, that's it. That's all you gotta do. And then tighten it up. All right. So the next thing I gotta do is I gotta set the string action height. Now I've already done some work with the nut on this thing as far as setting the action height. I did that a long time ago. The neck relief has already been set on this as well. And all I did was clean the frets. I didn't level them or crown them earlier, so I shouldn't have to change anything as far as the neck or the nut goes. So let me get my screwdriver so I can adjust this. Releasing some of the string tension is kind of a good idea as far as adjusting this. Now, if you end up releasing too much string tension, the pickups can end up drawing the string closer to them, changing what you're gonna be at your 12th or 17th fret. So what I like to do, You just turn them a little bit that way it releases some of the tension off them and they're not in tune so I give it like two turns two full turns on the tuners just to kind of loosen them up a little bit so it's not going to put that much stress on the back over here when you adjust it so I had this thing set at like really really low action the first time I should be able to get that same response as I had the first time with this for adjusting the action height on this. So I've got a sixteenth and a sixteenth. A sixteenth on this side and a sixteenth on this side. So right now I'm going to go ahead and tune this up. These locking tuners that are on this, they turn really smooth. So at a 16th and a 16th, do I get any fret noise? A little bit of fret noise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tweak this, because maybe a 16th and a 16th is way too low for this. But I don't want to go over 564s with this at all. Now, every time when I tune up a guitar and say that it's, you know, way sharp, I'll turn it back to where it is not way sharp and then start creeping up from there to put the string in tune. Now, if I check my intonation, it should be still set because I didn't change that and I didn't change the neck at all so if I put the neck yeah she's right on the money so with fret buzzing
It's been a while. Well, it's been a long while. All right, so this guitar is pretty much done. So this is taking a cheap house brand Guitar Center guitar and turning it into something that looks like it's been well taken care of, almost towards the brand new side of things, and just giving it new life, so to say. A lot of people would sit there and say, or actually one person I know that would sit there and say that guitars shouldn't look like art, you know. Well, if they come from the factory looking like this, well, this is art, and this is how, you know, they present themselves. You got basic guitars where they're just sprayed one color and, and that's it, but then you have stuff that is a little bit more flashy, and keeping the little bit more flashy, actually, actually keeping any guitar flashy as far as you know making it look nice and keeping it look nice uh, even if it's a workhorse you know if it's got some chips in it or whatever you know still clean it polish it up a little bit and those all those chips have a history behind it and scratches have a history behind it and uh, you know it just kind of makes a, the guitar a little bit more interesting something like this that doesn't have any chips on it uh, has some minor scratches on it. it has a few issues with it here and there obviously with this one here with the little nick that was on the headstock that's been repaired um, had some type of a history behind it as well but it wasn't in that bad a shape to where I couldn't restore the finish back to the way this was when it was new only problem is is because these pickups are polished the way they are they don't have a um, they got like a metal brushed look to them and one of them's got a scratch going across it, and it kind of reminds me of one of the strings might have crossed it, and you know, you really can't fix that at all without ruining the nice brush look of these pickups. And I think the brush look of these pickups, especially the way that it looks more polished around the uh, pole pieces, um, really give this thing a nice look as far as how this how the guitar is. And adding the black in here and then blacking out each hole over here kind of gives it a nice little clean look as well. So I'm going to plug this thing in and kind of show you a few little things because I did something with that tone control a while back that basically eliminates having a few pedals.